a lot of brokers know what's listed and what potential it has. And they can also tell you, hey, man, three builders have looked at this. They've all passed. If you hear those words, run. <laughs> Normally, those are smart people. And if they're passing, it's for a reason. Don't try to work a miracle. Try to find the base hits, not the ones that you got to make some magic happen. So, yeah, just start having those conversations. That is a great tip. Like, if it smells like crap, might be crap. Hey, welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Eat, Sleep, and Invest. I'm your host, Brian Driscoll, and I'm here with Council Glenn. What's up, man? How you doing, bro? Living the dream, living the dream. <laughs> We're going to switch it up a little bit today. Council is going to be talking about land entitlement. So, Council, why don't you give everybody a little background how you even found it into land entitlement? That's like such a niche. Yeah, yeah. Great question, man. Appreciate you having me on today. So it kind of started with my real estate journey. Um, one of the things I never realized, my first ever wholesale deal was a piece of land. <laughs> like I thought about that when telling my story. But I mean, typical wholesaling journey started, you know, driving for dollars, Google Voice, you know, just hustling, getting after it. And then we started buying lists to having cold callers. And in my county, for some reason, they were listing vacant land at 64 bedrooms. So I started getting a ton of land on my list. We would just skip past it for months. And at one particular day, I looked at one lead and I knew the address. I knew where it was at. I made a phone call to a buddy of mine and said, hey, man, what can we do with this? It was about a 19 acre track of land in, in a donut. And what we call a donut is it had houses surrounding it. And he walked me through the whole development process, entitlement and development. So me, once I heard it, you know, we got started, got it a few steps, you know, Go across the start line, I just started tying land up and doing the same thing, you know, rinse and repeat. So that's how I got started, man. Just vacant land on my list. Didn't know what to do with it. It didn't have a house. So I, I didn't have a calculator for it. Didn't know how to do anything with it. Made a couple phone calls and that started the journey. Now, entitling. Everyone's always thinking like, oh, yeah, I'm going to buy land. And I think everybody's under the impression or some people it's like, OK, I'm going to buy it and resell it. But then everyone talks about entitlement. Like what is what are you talking about when you say you're going to entitle? Land? Yeah. So a couple of things. A lot of times I've heard people say entitlement is just rezoning. And so we've done that, of course, that's part of the entitlement process. But entitlement is getting uh, literally a set of engineered plans approved by the governing municipality, whether that's the county, city to allow you to build a subdivision of whatever size on said piece of land. So my first deal was 7.8 acres. We were able to fit 26 houses. So we had to submit that through the city with full engineering, uh, civil drawings with water, sewer, grading, curb, gutter, all of that information, and go through a few rounds of revisions to get it approved by the city. Once that stamp is on it, that's when the value actually comes in because you have a shovel ready site. So that's the entitlement, getting a, a fully engineered set of plans approved by the governing municipality for a subdivision. How long does that take? It depends on where you're at. Uh, in Greensboro, it could be six to nine months. If you go to Raleigh, Durham, it's 18 months minimum. <laughs> uh, certain areas, Texas is a little bit faster. Uh, Florida is a little bit faster, but typically nine to 12 months, un unless you're in a a place where staffing is an issue or they, the workload is just massive. Okay. So, so somebody getting into this space, they got to expect like cash out to cash back. That cycle is fairly large. Yeah, it is. It is. It, it's going to be, I would say, plan on a year before you see a return. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Let's talk about a deal. Like what, what's the best deal you've done? Yeah. So we got one. Uh, we just got an LOI this week at last week. Uh, it's a 27 acre site in Shelby, North Carolina, outside of Charlotte. We were able to fit 51 houses on it. We haven't done the full entitlement yet. We're almost done with it. We bought it for 150 grand. Uh, cost us about 70 grand for the entitlements, surveys, engineers, wetlands, phase one. Uh, the LOI we got is for 1.4. Oh yeah. That's pretty solid. Yeah. That, that's, that's not bad. How'd you find that? That was actually a JV partner brought that one to me. Oh, so that's interesting because you work with, well, actually, I'll even take a step back. So entitlements, from what I know about them, aren't the simplest thing. It's like, okay, you got to deal with the borough. You got to deal with all this stuff. But I know you work with investors. Say somebody newer in the space, if they find a deal, they can hit you up and you guys work out a JV. Works a couple different ways, man. Um, the way I prefer for it is an investor who understands that it's going to be a process. I also want to teach, you know, as we learn. So, I, I, yeah, we'll be, you know, the driver, 
but you'll be right along for the ride can, you know, copy on every email, invited to every Zoom call. I normally like to meet with my engineers on a biweekly basis, regardless of the project or location. There's always the entitlement fee, whatever that fee is for the engineers and surveys. Typically, the investor or the JV partner takes care of that. And then we do an equity split on a profit on the back end. Of course, they'll get reimbursed for you know all their fees that they've paid out. And then we'll do an equity split on the back end. How did you get into real estate? Like, What made you even want to get into the real estate space? Oh, man. I, I got to take you back to Chicago, 98. <laughs> Ninth grade. I uh, had to declare majors. Kind of weird. In high school. It was either math, reading, or drafting. I was always pretty good at math. I couldn't spell too well. I still can't. So I didn't know the reading. And my mom thought drafting was wood shop. So I signed up for drafting, did a two-week summer program, and fell in love with drawing a building downtown. Always thought I wanted to be an architect, man. I got a, a drafting table for my 16th birthday. <laughs> Used to buy a magazine and just draw houses, man. So i Always knew I wanted to be in construction, real estate in some shape, way, shape, or form since ninth grade, man. Uh, I, I wasn't uh, you know, doing a lot of work for uh, contractors, and I just noticed how they were finding off-market properties, and I was tired of getting my, my price beat down and saw their huge profit margin. So I just learned how they found the properties, which was wholesaling. The rest was history. That's interesting, because most of the guys I talk to that want to get into real estate, they're like, I took a real estate wholesale course and I want to make money. So you got into it a different way. You're like, you liked that part of it and it just pushed you into real estate versus the financial side. Correct. Yeah. I, I fell in love with the, the architecture at first. And then once I learned just, you know, through flipping a few houses, building a few, just being in the industry that there was a, a more profitable version of it uh, as opposed to, you know, change orders and just craziness of uh, dealing with homeowners um, that you can you know do it for yourself. Do you think that the way you think, I don't think that way, like drafting would drive me freaking bonkers, but <laughs> like with land, do you, do you think that allows you to see things differently too and see different opportunities on what that land could turn into? I think it, it does, but it's a totally different set of eyes, if that makes sense. So figuring out a layout for a house is totally different than designing roads based on, you know, topography and where your sewer and water connections are and the size lots that you want to have ready for your end buyer or whoever that builder is. There's a lot of, uh, of decision making that goes into that process. What it does allow you to do, though, is see the value in the land. One of the things that I've learned and, and have learned in the land space is typically what's, what separates, I think, land from houses is Two things. Number one, there's not an, always an emotional attachment to the land. So, you know, sellers are typically more willing to sell. It's not the house they grew up in. You know, they didn't raise the kids there. It's just land. Two, I have never up in, yeah, I have never not been able to offer a seller what they ask for because of what I can improve the value to. So typically when I'm willing to or have the ability to pay a seller full asking price, I can get whatever terms I want on the back end, whether that's that extra nine, 12 months I need to get it fully engineered before we close, as long as they know they're getting the price they're asked for, you know, they're willing to give on the timeline. So that's one of the things I've learned. Like I said, that the emotion attachment and if you're able to give them full price, you can do whatever you want on the back end as far as time goes. Yeah. And you're saying like you can get full price because you can, well, number one, be a little bit creative. It's like, okay, I can give you full price, but I need X. And then yep. you have so much profit that's going to come. It's just not coming for 12 to 18 months, but it works out and you can create a win-win for the seller and you. Yeah. Again, the land's just sitting there. It's not going anywhere. Taxes normally aren't too crazy. So it's, it's no, no immediate need to sell. But, and they, they norm, typically can wait the time frame that's necessary for us to do the entitlements. We have a lot of real estate investors, mostly single families, but a couple of guys in land uh, on our, that watch our stuff. If somebody wants to start doing land, like what, what would you tell somebody, knowing what you know and how you got into it, how you would recommend starting so they didn't get punched in the face a couple of times? So they could skip that little bit of hurt. <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting question, man. I think that if, if I was starting fresh right now and it's specific with land entitlement, because you got, you know, have people that buy land. I just got a, a letter in the mail today from somebody offering us like $100,000 on some land that we bought for five fifty and are developing and selling. You know, just a blind offer they sent out. But if you want to do specifically land entitlement, I will look on your LoopNet, uh, Crexy, 
Zillow for vacant land listed by a uh, agent or broker and, and call them up and, um, you know, just see what information they have on it. Normally, if it's a residential zoning or potential development, they'll have that in the description. And, and start talking with the brokers just to see, hey, what information do you have? What's the current zone? Is there any new construction going on around it? I think building relationships with people that know a little bit more and can be assets for you will help out a ton. But be ready to, I mean, you know, once you start to get land under contract, you know, it's normally 5000 you know, in due diligence, earnest money deposits. And then you got to start that process of, you know, your checklist, making sure environmentally everything is fine with the land, uh, getting the sketch plan done and, you know, trying to send that out to de- builders and developers. But I think just having conversations at the start will, will get you going because a lot of brokers know what's listed and what potential it has. And, and they can also tell you, hey, man, three builders have looked at this. They've all passed. If you hear those words, run. <laughs> uh, normally, those are smart people. And if they're passing, it's for a reason. Don't try to work a miracle. You know, try to find the base hits. Not the ones that you gotta, you know, make some magic happen. So, yeah, just start having those conversations. That is a great tip. Like, if it smells like crap, might be crap. Like, if smart people have seen it, stay away. Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. You know, if it's if it's been on the market for a while, and you know, several different people have looked at it and haven't been able to make it work, don't try to make it work. One of the things we have to our advantage is, is you know, real estate investors. A lot of us started off wholesaling. So we know how to find off market deals. It's the same conversations. It's the same contract. Just ask for longer terms, you know, and, and the, the rate of yeses to no's is a lot higher uh, just because it's land. It's literally no emotional attachment. The only time I found that time is a crunch is if there's a sick family member. We had that happen before where, you know, mom wasn't doing too well. They wanted to settle her estate before she passed. And they just they were pushing for a quicker close than the nine months. We were able to make it happen, but typically, yeah, it's out of sight, out of mind. You know, keep them informed on the process and, and just keep things moving along, and you'll be fine. That's cool. I hear that a lot too with land because in the house I just met with a seller yesterday. They're selling a house. It's actually a, a second family, like a vacation house, and they're talking about you know what we have all these. There's pictures of kids on the wall, and like we have all these memories here, and you have all the emotion in like brick and mortar. Where land is just land, like they might have inherited it or just sitting there paying taxes. So it's not as not as emotional there. Not at all, man. Uh, especially if it's vacant land, like no, no, and, and you know, out of state or even if they're in another city, all they're doing is paying taxes and, and maybe having it bush hauled, you know, once or twice a year. So yeah, if you can take it off their hands for the price they want, they'll make a deal. It's cool. All right, so. I saw on your, I think it might have been Facebook or Instagram yesterday, you had a video that was pretty decent. Run through what you were talking about on there, because I thought that was interesting, like the things you're looking at with land. Yeah, so it was the just the first three things I look at when I find a parcel of land. I think I drew a square. <laughs> I said, imagine it's 10 acres. One of the first things I'm checking is zoning. What is it currently zoned? And yeah, it may be agricultural, RS3, R, RS40. Whatever the zoning is, it doesn't matter to an extent because if it's not the zoning I want or need, I'm looking around to see what the zoning is. We're neighboring parcels. Is it anything that's a higher density within a half mile radius? Uh, Because the likelihood of me getting it rezoned increases if there's a zoning similar to what I want nearby. In my area, in North Carolina, again, we have deals nationwide, but in North Carolina, definitely want to get wetlands checked. You know, make sure there's no creeks running through. If it is, you want to see how much of an impact that crease has on your developable land, if that's a word, <laughs> but how much land you can develop based on the wetlands. And the third thing I'm checking is, so I said zoning, wetlands. I think the phase one was third. I think that was yeah, it. Utilities. Utilities is what I saw in there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Never mind. Perfect. Thank you for reminding me. Utilities. Uh, one of the things for depending on your area, but for your first deal, if you can try to stay away from well and septic in Texas, that may be a different story because I've, I've never had an issue with dirt in Texas for a septic tank. But in North Carolina, man, the, the soils can vary from city to city when you're dealing with septic and there's a certain level or quality soil, soil that you need for septic tanks. So try to stick with stuff that has water and sewer available. And you always, always, always want to call 
whoever that service provider is, whether that's a city or a private company, and make sure they have capacity for a subdivision and, and give them a number of houses and, and, and ask for a will serve letter if you can. Because if, if they have water so available, yes, but make sure they have capacity. Because I've run into that, man. We had like a, a six parcel assemblage, 100 acres, water and sewer was available, but they didn't have capacity. It was going to take the engineer a year to give them a report on what they need to do to improve. And then another year for them to actually install it. So I was two years up too early. <laughs> you know what? That's a good point, too, because some people would just check. Yeah, there's all the utilities here. And I'm guessing water is probably like the diameter of the pipe or something, like how much water they can get to you there if it can't house and support more more homes and your SOL. Yeah, yeah. You definitely want to check and make sure it has capacity. Just because you see it in a road on a GIS or you, you see the neighbor or a water line or you see a fire hydrant on, on Google Street View, that's great. But make sure that they have capacity because I've run into that before where we checked the box and saw that they had it, but never called and checked capacity until we got all six sellers to agree to sell. And then we found out there was no water and sewer capacity. So yeah, we didn't have a deal. Yeah. Now, now when you're, so we're, let's talk about zoning. So you see a property, it's owned RS3 or whatever you're talking about. Like, I'm guessing that's residential, right? Res, it's zoned residential yep. would be RS3. Mm -hmm. If you see it, some zone RS3, like what's the most profitable, I guess every area is going to be different, but like, what's a, what's a zoning? If you're like, boy, if I could turn it into this in most situations, it, that's what we want to do. Yeah. So three units, an acre RS3, no, that's normally what that means. It, it's pretty good. RS5 is whew, five units an acre. That's pretty great. That's when you get your, you know, oh, that's what the number is. The number after is like units per acre. Typically, unless you get an RS10. That's normally 10,000 square feet per lot, which is a quarter acre lot. Sometimes you get RS20, RS40. Those are how, how many square feet per lot. When you get RM, residential multifamily, 8, 12 units an acre, that's normally when you have like townhomes or apartments. I would say single family homes, you know, five units an acre, that, that's pretty dense. Unless you're trying to do towns, townhomes, you want 8 to 12 units an acre if you're trying to do townhomes. But even if it's agricultural, land. If you can uh, rezone it from agriculture to three units per acre, the density is a lot, a lot more than the agricultural land because typically agricultural lots are 40,000 square foot, which is basically okay. an acre lot. Yeah. So if it's agriculture, it might be worth 4,000 an acre versus you switch it to something else could be worth 40,000 an acre or whatever. You know what I mean? Yep. 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 Now wetlands, like up here in Pittsburgh, we have creeks. We call them creeks, but you got, everyone else calls them creeks or one or the other. So you're talking, you have, a, you have a creek or water or anything going through the property. You want to take a look at that because once you start building, say that little creek, that might take, are you talking in terms of like flood plan, like flood zones? Like if yeah, it, when the yeah, water comes, it 100%. could just like expand? Yeah. So we, we have a pilot environmental here locally that we have come out. And I've had that situation happen, man. We had a, we knew there was a creek there. So we accounted for it. We had the wetlands delineated, uh, which, you know, they said, hey, there's no damage outside of the creek because it was pretty deep. And so we drew a sketch plan, 98 houses, submitted it for our, our, our first review. And the city came back and said, yeah, um, our, um, our UDO, our Uniform Development Ordinance says you have to be 100 feet off each side of the creek, regardless of the wetlands. Took away 36 lots. <laughs> Because we had to be a hundred feet off, even though there wasn't any impact in that area. So right. sometimes the UDO can mess you up, but even the wetlands, our first land deal I ever did, the seven acres, we drew it up for like, I think it was 20 townhomes and 36 single families. We knew we had some wetlands, but we didn't know the impact. But once we got the wetlands report back, half the site was underwater. So we had to reduce it to 26 single family homes total. That wetland, you want to get that back and try to know what your UDO says you can and can't do because you can start thinking you you got a two three million dollar property it turns out that it's a lot less because of the wetland impacts right because if you're taking 30 percent off the top that's that's big numbers that's real money yeah a huge huge deal. I mean we went from 98 to I think 58 so we lost 40 lots yeah because we had to be 100 feet off a creek that we knew was there and we had the wetlands delineated but we couldn't get a variance. Do you find that out before you purchase or are you finding that out after you own it? So I'm doing all of this while I'm still on the contract. Okay. Yeah. So 
to, like the first time the, the seven acres we went from i think we we have planned 50 houses but we were able to squeeze a lot more in luckily for this one i price anchored the seller at ten thousand dollars per buildable lot that we could create so our initial contract was half a million dollars once we got the wetlands back in the engineer redrew everything and we ended up with 26 lots i submitted that to them hey you know, because of the wetlands, we were only able to get 26. So we were able to, hey, okay, we agreed to 10,000 per buildable lot, 260,000. That saved us because we price anchored on a per lot. I don't typically pay attention to the per acre price because I may be able to get two units an acre or five units an acre. You know, it, it, the, I normally figure my offer on based on how many lots I can get. But yeah, we were able to price anchor luckily. So that saved us. Let me ask you this. If somebody's just getting into this and like we were talking before, they come across a property and they don't know what to do yet. They're like, you know what? It looks like a killer deal. And they wanted to work with you, say on the JV side. What's the best way for people to connect with you? So a website would be a good way. Uh, www.entitleland, E-N-T-I-T-L-E-L-A-N-D.com or any of my socials. Um, you know, Instagram, Facebook would be either one of those would be cool. We actually do have a, a free Facebook group for land entitlement. Uh, we, we're going live. We go live every Tuesday almost, unless I'm out of town and just kind of talk about different topics in land entitlement. But either one of those ways are the best. I'm, I love working with seasoned real estate investors who don't know what they're doing. They have a good operation going and, and, and they're, they see the benefit of entitlement. Let me quarterback the deal. They, they can, you know, watch from the sidelines, hop in when needed. It, it creates a great, uh, opportunity for some uh, JV deals and profit sharing at the end for those investors. Yeah. And that makes sense too, because a lot of the seasoned investors, they, they're coming across deals all the time. And then you just come across other stuff, you know, like land or yeah. whatever. It's like, sometimes they may pass. This gives you, this gives an area to recoup some of the marketing costs, learn, learn how to do it. You know, one of the things we're working on and we almost have complete is the ability to, if an investor was able to export all of their land leads we can layer it over a, a software that we have and and show you your top three opportunities for entitlement and what the based on your notes on you know hey we we have this seller at this price but it's just land we don't know what to do with it i can tell you what your potential property is how many houses we can get how long it'll take who we can sell it to just based you know, on some filters that we have on some software that we're working on so that's one of the things i really really am excited about to be able to to go into an investor crm they send us a file. Two days later, we send them a you know seven page you know report with their top three opportunities and seeing which one they want to JV and do. That's interesting too because anyone listening doing online marketing, you definitely have land leads there because we get them all the time. People just fill out your ad to sell their house, but it's land, and right. I mean, most people just disregard it. So you're saying they can export those out, shoot them to you. Here's a hundred of them. You just say, hey, here's the top three. Go try to get these. Yeah, yeah, because. Again, w once we get those top three, uh, again, I have a, a partner uh, who we, we're doing the same process with, was able to find a property for him. And it's it's like a $900,000 spread on one deal for a, a 10 acre track of land that he'll make with JV on it, have, have a nice split with a, a large portion going his way. But he's taking care of all those entitlement costs. Why I say that is if we have a hundred and we go get all a hundred and, you know, we got a hundred surveys to pay for and they're all $25,000 each. That's going to run through some cash quick. So let, let's start with, you know, two, maybe three at the most, just so that we can get those entitlement fees out the way. I literally have a bill for a survey coming. I know this week for $70,000 on a 30 acre track, but it's the price of doing business. Yep. <laughs> so you got to be able to take care of those costs. And that's why you don't want to go game busters on just sending out huge, you know, marketing to those land because you probably have some in your CRM already that we can capitalize on. Let's, let's, Let's get a few deals done and then let's, you know, increase the volume just because of the entitlement cost. You can easily spend, normally I like to budget 1500 per lot for entitlement. So if we're doing a 10 acre, a 10, a 10 home site entitlement, you know, 1500 times 10 budget 15,000 for the entitlement fees. You know, you're doing a hundred lots, 150,000. So, you know, I like to say to let my investors know that's what they should expect to spend on an entitlement piece, but. We normally sell in paper lots so about twenty five thousand a lot. The better the area, the more you can sell it for. But we're well under twelve thousand between purchase and entitlement, so it creates a huge spread. Yeah, that's interesting. You said for them to hit you up on uh, social too. What's your um, handle on Instagram? 
Instagram is my first name. Uh, so it's Count CL F Glenn. Let me make sure of that. <laughs> I think, yes, Count CL F Glenn is my social on IG. Okay, cool. And we'll put it in the show notes too. You guys can check it out. Yeah, sweet. Good. So I don't have to confirm it. <laughs> yep. Yeah. We'll put it down in the, in the notes. Yeah. Instagram, Facebook, we got the free group too. So yeah. What's your top book you'd recommend to people just in general? Oh man. Rigging the game. Nice. Yeah. So for me, it it's probably one of the best books I read outside of Vivid Vision. That was probably my number one book. But what was Rigging that? the Game. Vivid Vision. Vivid Vision. Okay. Yeah, man. It, it brought so much clarity on just what I want to do and how to do it. Built to Sell was another great one. <laughs> it, it just talks about simplifying the process and niching down or honing in on one thing. You know, what do you do best? You know, I, I know a lot of, and no, no knock against a lot of people, wholesale, fix and flip, hotel, no vape, sub to new construction. If you have to, you know, do one or two of those things, which one or two could you do well? And normally you can, if you, if you lock in on that, you, your profit won't change. You actually do better. Yep. Money's in the niches. Yes, sir. Yep. I a hundred percent agree with that too. Yeah. Cause if you focus on one thing, your profit usually multiplies quickly. Cause then you're just focused and you're a specialist there versus a jack of all trades. So I agree with you. Yep. Yep. Good stuff. Hey, well, thanks for coming on, man. We appreciate you. Appreciate you, man. Thanks for having me. It's been, a, it's been fun. Good stuff. Hey, everyone listening. Thanks for listening. Get out there, crush it, close some deals. We'll see you guys.